Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and we are continuing with this big last vision of Daniel. And the more that I thought about it, um, I was thinking about just doing the rest of chapter 11 uh, today. However, I do think that verses 36 um, through uh, verse 45, or the end of the chapter, really go well with the beginning of chapter 12. So what I'm going to do, we are going to look at uh, verses 21 through 35 today, which I believe are just about Antiochus, the the fourth Epiphanes, uh, and his reign of terror and deception, as we will see uh, today. But for here, it is all about the appointed time. That phrase is going to come up here uh, a couple of times within this passage, and it really goes to show that everything that happens is in its appointed time, whether it is the raising up of empires or the dest- uh, destroying or the fall of empires or, uh, as it comes with Antiochus IV, um, the destruction of very, very bad forces. And so with that being said, I think that's what we're going to really, really see in this passage. So join with me, uh, Daniel chapter 11. Uh, We're going to start in verse 21 and then make our way through verse 35. And again, just like last time, um, I will be doing some names and some dates Uh, And I have gotten those from Christ-Centered Exposition Commentary Series in the Book of Daniel, written by Danny Aiken, uh, edited by David Platt, Danny Aiken, and Tony Merida. We're going to be looking at pages 149 through uh, 153 today. And again, we're not going to read the whole entire thing. We're just using it as a guide as we look at what Scripture has to say here. So, verse 21 In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So, uh, just a reminder, this is talking about the north, or the Seleucids, uh, and Seleucus IV is the he, or the his place, that we see uh, at the beginning of verse 21. So, in Seleucus the fourth's place, we have Antiochus the fourth come into power. However, that should not have been the case because uh, Demetrius the fourth, the Demetrius the first, was actually the rightful ruler, uh, or should have been the rightful ruler of the northern kingdom. I think that is why we get uh, this phrase here: "To whom royal majesty has not been given." Uh, basically, Antiochus IV saw an opportunity to take power, and he took it. Now, it's not entirely clear if he did use a military coup, uh, but he definitely used political skills as part of this taking power, as we see at the end of verse 21. Uh, He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Another way to um, interpret that that Hebrew word, uh, that, uh, that word there for flatteries is Uh, in fact, uh, could be seen as deceits or lies. Uh, But basically, he's most likely using political skills, uh, oratory skills, uh, just leadership, uh, but in a deceitful manner. I think that's probably how Antiochus IV came to power, and not necessarily by a military coup. So, with that being said, uh, Antiochus IV uh, has come to power. Verse twenty, uh, verse twenty-two, uh, and again, sorry, uh, Antiochus the Fourth reigned from one seventy-five to one sixty-three uh, BC. That is when Antiochus the Fourth reigned as the Northern King. 
Verse 22, army shall be hardly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. So there's a couple things about here. Uh, this is probably referencing Ptolemy the sixth, who reigned from 181 to 146 BC. This probably references uh, two fights with him. Uh, but when it comes to the prince of the covenant, this is interesting uh, because when we're talking about covenant and the land of promise, it's talking about Israel. So uh, who could this be referring to? Well, Antiochus IV actually deposes Onias III, who uh, was the rightful high priest in Jerusalem. Onias III was assassinated in 171 BC, and a lot of people think that Antiochus IV had that plan carried out um, against Onias III. So Onias III uh, is actually seen as the prince of the covenant mentioned there at the end of verse 22. Uh, verse 23, and from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall be, become strong with a small people. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his fathers' his fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. So again, this is probably referencing to a campaign uh, by Antiochus IV uh, against Egypt, uh, specifically against the Ptolemies or the Southern Kingdom. Um, but I think what's interesting here is this reference to a only for a time. Uh, as we'll see eventually, this is uh, definitely referring to Rome's arrival on the scene, uh, but I also think it's just referring to the fact that even with somebody as awful as Antiochus IV was, uh, even his reign was only for a time, or appointed for a time. Um, but don't get me wrong, during those times, it was awful to see. Uh, and it continued to be. Verse 25, And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for plots shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him, his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail, for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. And he shall come back, or shall return, to his land with great rich wealth, uh, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. And he shall work his will and return to his own land. So all of that is to say that Antiochus IV and, uh, and the southern kingdom or um, the, the, the Ptolemies, they tried and tried to get these different um, peace treaties and alliances together, but it just never worked because of the egos of those two rulers. And so, therefore, as Antiochus IV leaves Egypt as a victor and as uh, very, very rich, he then sees, though, this land, um, this, this holy covenant that his heart is then set on, and that will lead them to uh, the invasion of Jerusalem. So... Uh, we do see that come about uh, with the uh, with the whole with the invasion of Jerusalem. But there is something that happens before that, though. Verse twenty nine: At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south. So he's going back to uh, the region where Egypt is. But it shall not be this time as it was before, for ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. Uh, he shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Now we'll get to that 
uh, end part of verse 30 here in just a second. So Antiochus IV goes and uh, tries another campaign against the Ptolemies in the south in the region of Egypt. Uh, but this time it does not go as well. Uh, these ships of Kittim are possibly referencing uh, to uh, a... a a Roman fleet from the area of Cyprus. So we finally see Rome kind of introduce themselves here, uh, not overtake at this time, but introduce themselves as a player on this world stage. And it becomes such a they become such a threat to Antiochus IV that he actually gives up. Um, the Roman commander, Gaius Popelius Lenus, uh, actually was sent in order to uh, intimidate Antiochus IV, and he does his job well. Antiochus IV, as we see in Scripture, is afraid and withdraws, and he does withdraw, uh, but sadly he withdraws in humiliation, um, and then his humili humiliation and his anger is sadly then turned uh, to Jerusalem. So he comes back and attacks uh, Jerusalem and befriends those that don't that live in or around Jerusalem and do not necessarily love the Jews and their practices. Uh, and so therefore he begins this destruction of Jerusalem, which we believe again probably took place um, in 167 BC. That's where we see the really just the the climax of the destruction of Jerusalem from Antiochus IV. And that's where we pick up at verse 31. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall humble, they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white, until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. So... We will get to all of that here. So you have Antiochus IV. Um, he does come into Jerusalem, and he does bring in a statue of Zeus and erects it in the in the place of worship. Um, my guess it probably happened uh, sometime in December of 167 BC. Um, that's what we have seen uh, in in just ancient texts like the book of Maccabees um that is kind of what we're seeing as what happened during that time uh the abomination isn't just the altar though that was built he also brought in pigs and slaughtered them within the temple grounds and and as we see from the Old Testament law, that would have been an absolute travesty because pigs were seen as unclean. So you're basically profaning the whole entire temple of the Lord uh, by doing this, and that's what he did. And yet, even after all of this, as verse 32 says, uh, shows he was still able to get people around that region and say, ah, you know, it's okay to do this against uh, against the holy covenant, against the people of Jerusalem of the Jews. Uh, it's okay to do that, though. It, we, you you should be celebrating this, and sadly, a lot of them do. But thankfully, as the end of verse thirty two, and then uh, verses thirty three and thirty four and 35 show that that is not the end. Uh, there are a, a 
faction, a remnant of Israelites that bore the people of the Holy Covenant uh, that stand firm in their faith. I think this could be referencing to the Maccabeans and the Maccabean revolt. Um, but it is... Yeah, it is just showing the end of Antiochus the Fourth's reign in Jerusalem. But I think it's also referencing specifically verse 35, referencing the end of Antiochus the uh, Fourth completely. Uh, Antiochus the Fourth. Um, probably died in 163 BC. Uh, it was believed to be during a, an expedition in Persia, and a lot of scholars believe that it was insanity that led to his death, uh, which is a fitting end for Antiochus IV Epiphanes. But the big thing, and where I want to end today, is that phrase at the end of verse 35, for it still awaits the pointed time. From here, verse 36, I think, depicts somebody that is different from Antiochus IV, and we'll get to that on Thursday. Uh, but I think that is depicting the Antichrist. So when it's talking about for it still awaits the point in time, um, and then, of course, the phrase before it, until the time of the end, I think it's pointing towards the time of the Antichrist and the time of the end. Uh, but for me, the phrase there, for it still awaits the appointed time. Therefore, God, in his sovereignty and in his, and in his knowledge, has orchestrated every single event for uh, his glory, which is hard to wrap our minds around because some of those events and their appointed times, uh, when those happened and, and uh, and how long they happen for, deal with these very hard and just wicked people, whether it be Antiochus the Fourth, Epiphanes, whether it be um, whether it be Joseph Stalin, whether it be Adolf Hitler, you have these awful people that are that are on the scene and they do awful things. But every single one of them is only for a, an appointed time. And then all the work that they do, all the horrible things that they do, is then uh, thrown into memory, into history memory. Now, again, obviously, it doesn't mean that those things are not still awful. They are. Uh, but when it comes to the appointed time, though, God reduces the amount of time that they have whatever they are doing. And that is something that should be encouraging. Obviously, we wish that we could live in a world that is, you don't have an Antiochus IV, you don't have a Stalin, you don't have an, a, a Hitler, um, you don't have these war just criminals in history past and today and in the future. Obviously, we wish we were part of that world where you don't have those people, but sadly, we are. We do live in a fallen world, and so because of that, you will have folks that come into power, that come onto the scene, that do awful, awful things. And yet without God, those people would have complete reign to do whatever they wanted for as long as they want, and nothing would be uh, in their way to oppose them. But thankfully, thankfully, we serve and love the God that sets appointed times for things. And, uh, and thankfully, we see that with the reign of Antiochus the Fourth, and with other just horrible periods of history as well. Uh, it doesn't make them easier to think about. It's still difficult to think about those times and those things. But to know that we have a God that is watching every single part of history is in itself an encouragement uh, and should make us long to ask him questions, um, to worship him, and to uh, and to see what he is up to um, through prayer as well. So with that being said, 
Thank you for spending a little bit of time with me uh, here today with the Brahmin Word. I will see you on Thursday as we end not just this great last vision, but the whole book of Daniel as a whole. So I will see you on Thursday. Thanks.